Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek. This is the latest in a series of videos I'm doing on Secrets of Westeros. We've looked uh, at a few of the most mysterious places and people so far. We've looked at Old Valyria, uh, we looked at the Faceless Men, we've looked at Winterfell. Today we're going to look at one of the oldest and probably one of the scariest places we've got in the entire continent. And I've got uh, a first timer for this channel, but uh, someone who's been in this community for a very long time. Um, uh, so I will introduce him now. This is Michael. Do you want to say hi? Oh, hello. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm so excited. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Michael. People probably know me as Bookshelf Stud um, on Twitter. And I'm one of the, the moderators, the maesters of the Song of Ice Fire subreddit. Um, so people may also know me from Maester Monthly, um, which is a uh, pseudo monthly podcast about Song of Ice and Fire. I think we're now calling it Maester Occasionally, aren't we? Yeah, Maester, yeah. Maester, Maester Quarterly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But it, it, it is coming back soon. I have it on good authority after we were tap talking just before we went uh, on air. Um, but let's talk today about the Night Fort. I know this is something that you've uh, you've talked about before. You've done a lot of thinking about. Uh, why don't we start with a bit of the background? This is an old fort. It's one of the forts along the, the wall, obviously, and this is old. It's twice as old as Castle Black. Do you want to give us a sort of a high-level overview of like the, the history what, what do we know about its origins and stuff like that? Yeah, right. I mean, it, it it's so much of its history is tangled up in in like boogeyman stories and scary mm -hmm. stories. Um, it's inseparable. It is it is the oldest and largest castle on the wall, like you said. Um, and when it comes to like the big highlights of the history, this is where we have stories like the Rat Cook and the Seventy Nine Sentinels, and and uh, where Danny Flint died. Um, I believe this is also where the um, Night King had it, the Night King had his seat um, in the Thirteenth Lord Commander, um, and many years before Aegon arrived, it, it already started to dwindle. And um, by the time of I think the Dance of the Dragons, it was pretty much a hundred percent abandoned, um, especially after the gift was given by uh by Alisan Targaryen um but yeah that's that's kind of i think the 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 high level overview right is it's it's ancient and filled with scary stories and has been abandoned for like living memory plus a couple living memories yeah absolutely and it was you know, i think you talk about Queen Alison. We we read about it. It was in Fire and Blood when she goes up and she she flies up there and uh, she visits it and she sees this, this huge sprawling. We'll get into a little bit of the detail about what's there in just a moment, but this is huge sprawling space without many members of the Night's Watch left. And she basically says, "You can't. This isn't fit for purpose. You know, there's, there's, there's like only a few of you in this massive place." So she then she sells her own jewels to create. Uh, another castle a little bit further on down, a few miles away, um, at Deep Lake, and mm. then persuades them to move out of the Night Fort and go to there. So by the time, and this was in something like 59 AC, something like that, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, uh, th this is yeah, two and a half centuries ago that it was abandoned. And occasionally the Night's Watch was sort of passed by and all the rest of it just to make sure it's still there. But, you know, it hadn't been populated. So what when we see it in the books, which is when uh, Bran goes up there, as well, and yeah. Team Bran, when they're going up towards the try and head north of the wall, that is what the situation is. It's this ancient, ruined place that is almost given over to nature. Um, but what you say, you guys, is kind of like lots of mysterious and spooky stories and all the rest of it. Um, just in terms of the place as it is now, it's quite overgrown. Well, are there any kind of particular things you'd want to draw our attention to that are quite interesting in what is there? Well, there's there's kind of one big elephant in the room there, which is the the Black Gate, but I think we'll talk about that. We'll, we'll save our, yeah, our absolutely, thoughts on the Black yeah. Gate. Um, it has these underground tunnels and and this labyrinthine sort of underground portion of the castle, which I guess could be compared to Castle Black has the, uh, the worm ways. Is that what they're called? The mm -hmm. like storage tunnels and ice cells and all that. Um, but it seems more extensive. Um, and there's also 
my, one of my favorite details about the ruin as it is now is the huge weirwood growing up through a hole in the kitchen um in in what was once the kitchen um I mean, there's trees coming up all through it, but I think that that image of the weirwood kind of busting up through the kitchen floor is, uh, I don't know, for me, that's very evocative. And that that's that's very, like, classically scary in A Song of Ice and Fire is just this this ghostly white tree emerging from the the, the, the black ruins of the castle. Um, it's it's very Heron Hallish in that sense. You know, it's mm. this big, empty, ghostly shell of a castle. Yeah, it's and it's got everything you would imagine uh, a castle would have on huge scale. It's got the we, we hear about the stables can can hold hundreds of horses. I think they had dungeons. They could have something like five hundred p- prisoners in the dungeons. It could hold. Um, it's it's huge. It's got it's the only uh, one of the Night's Watch forts where the uh, there are stairs actually dug into the ice of the wall. So normally the the, the stairs are kind of like built onto the side or they've got a winch or something like that. But this there, the, you can actually walk up the steps. I think Mira actually does that when she goes there. She actually walks all the way up, which is, must be quite a big uh, um, effort. But uh, so you get all that. And like all of the Night's Watch castles, it's not a classic castle in the fact that it's not got an outer wall. Mm-hmm. And... The reason why none of these have got an outer wall is because they're not supposed to be castles. They're just places for people to be fortifying the wall. And a lot of that comes back to what you alluded to, to it earlier. A lot of uh, the, the, the legends around this place and the biggest legend around this place is of the Knights King. Mm-hmm. Um, now, this is a... A character that is uh, really only mentioned in legend. It's not the same as the Night King on the show, uh, but this has really captured everyone's imagination. And the, the kind of the symbolic stuff going on with the Night King is quite big. Well, again, do you want to just do a sort of a very high level? What is the the myth of the Night King? And then we'll try and focus it in on what what that means for this castle. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I mean, the Night King. Um the 13th Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, um, and he falls in love with a woman who is described as uh, having skin as white as the moon and blue, eyes as blue as ice, um, which is a pretty transparent other mm. White Walker connection. Um, and he loves her and, you know, marries her and makes her the night the Night's Queen, I guess. And um, they rule at the Night Fort for 13 years, according to the legends, which... 13th Night Commander, 13 years, it feels a lot like one of those things that's like been twisted through history as it as the details get lost. But um, yeah, that's that's the large overview. And then, of course, the Night's King is brought down by uh, a union of the King of Winter and Joramon, the King Beyond the Wall. Um, so Brandon, one of the Brandons, Brandon the Breaker, um, is the one who brings down the Night's King along with Joramon. Um, and... Yeah, I mean, he's he's definitely the darkest figure in the Night's Watch history, or at least the darkest figure that we know of and remember. Um, his name, his name and memory are erased, which I think is is unique among historical figures in this series. You know, it's it's something um, that's that's something that was done in in uh, like the Roman Empire, say, like if, if with particularly nasty emperors, there was you know this. Um, elimination of, of their name from history or, or records of them or coins with their image minted. Um, but this is really the only, the only king or ruler who gets that treatment in, in Aswaf. And so he's, he's just a particularly scary guy. Um, like you said, he's not a character like he is in the show. It, it's, it's this mm. mythical figure, which George R. R. Martin has, has clarified. I know has, has emphasized himself that it's two separate things. Um, but I'm sure we can definitely see some parallels between um, this this you know leader figure of among the others and this man who sort of sells his soul to the devil. Yes, and I think that that uh, the fact that you said there about the, that he was expunged from history, they they took away his name, uh, which which led old man to do the kind of the speculating, you know. Maybe maybe he was a brand. Maybe he was a Brandon like you. Um, that that uh, we do not know, and that seems to imply what he did was not just like bad stuff, because there's plenty of 
bad characters in Legends and all the rest of it, but this was completely beyond the pale. This was something horrific. We we hear the Legends are all about child sacrifices and things like that, which is pretty bad already, but there are some other, you know, when I say pretty bad, horrific, obviously, but uh, there are some other stories which are just as bad. We might mention another couple of them in just a moment, but um, it was from this that came this idea that the the Night's Watch forts shouldn't have another ball around on the south side. So right. uh, they could never actually, they're not, they're not setting up a fortification for themselves from the realms of men. They're just fortifying the realms of men from beyond the wall. Um, so uh, I've done loads of speculation about that actually with the connection with the Horn of Winter. This is why I knew it. Brandon the Breaker, spe my speculation is that he has to have that name for a reason. What did he break? My speculation is he broke the Horn of Winter, but that's that's another live stream entirely. Um, so uh, the we, we get that ancient legend, and this is one of the things when we get in the story, we get Bran coming up there um, uh, with uh, with Team Bran effectively. So Hodor's there, and, and uh, the, the, the the reeds and all the rest of it. So um, and they tell the. Uh, stories some of the stories that old man um uh, told um have you got any other favorites i mean there's there's lots of them connected with here have you got any other favorites that you'd want to sort of quickly regale us with oh well i mean yeah the the, the rat cook is absolutely mm. at the top of my list which is is for for a couple reasons but to for those who may not be as steeped in old nan's legends um he was just a simple cook at the night fort, um, but he he served an Andal king a pie that was made of the king's son. Um, the king, the, the the cook rather, had killed this prince, killed the son in revenge for some some wrong the king did him. Um, the king, of course, eats his son, and he's like, "Oh, this is delicious. Give me some more," uh, which is hilarious. <laughs> the moral of the story: the gods are angered, uh, not because of the murder not even because of the cannibalism but because the cook killed a guest under his own roof under under his roof um and so they cook they the gods curse the cook and turn him into a giant rat um who is doomed to be unable to eat anything but his own young um which i love the story of the night cook because it's um in universe it's a very spooky boogeyman story like it, it's mm. It's scary. There's this, you know, oh, there's an enormous white rat who still lives in the walls of the night fort and will will come out and eat you. Um, but it also teaches us a lot. George uses it as a mechanism to uh, uh, tell us about the importance of guest right, obviously. Um, but also, I think there's some interesting things there with like human and animal transformation and the old gods um, kind of commanding that. And and as we learn more about like warging and skin changing, um, I. I've found myself like revisiting the night cook with a different lens and being like, Oh yeah, maybe, maybe there's something here about the, the curse of being forced into an animal body and you have to live out the rest of your days that way. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think it's, it's such a good story because it tells us so much about a lot of different taboos in Westeros and mm -hmm. a lot of the like really steeped cultural traditions and, and, and mores and all that. Um, of course, guest right, obviously, is probably the most important there, uh, particularly for the Red Wedding. But yeah. Yeah. So it shows us that uh, I, I find this fascinating when I'm trying to apply it across to the Red Wedding because it immediately says, OK, so Walder Frey abused guest right. Therefore, he is cursed by the gods effectively is the, 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 the kind of the implication is that he did a terrible and horrific thing. Mm -hmm. Um on the show, what I found fascinating was the fact that Aya then comes in and, and replicates this legend by killing his uh, mm. some of his kids and putting them in a pie and serving them up. But that is that retribution to him? Yes, it is. So this is perhaps doing uh, a sort of going through with the, 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 the god's retribution back to him. But also it places her in the position of the rat cook. Now, I'm not saying this is exactly what's going to happen in the books. In fact, I suspect it probably won't happen that way. But I find it fascinating 
the fact that that this then places her, as you say, in the role of the rat cook, who could have in real life just been a skin changer of some kind, which, as we know, I uh, is. So um, I do wonder whether there's like a, a few levels of nod going on uh, down there to, to all of these stories. Um, another one of my favourites, Not, I mean, it's not because it's got a great backstories per se, it's the 79 Sentinels. These 79 um, Night's Watchmen headed off south. They were led, they abandoned their post. Um, they were led by the youngest son of Lord Ricewell. And they go to House Ricewell thinking, oh, we'll have some safety there. We'll be okay if, as long as we make it. But Lord Ricewell is not happy and he sends them back up to the wall and the punishment for them is that they get their cells are dug out of the ice of the wall. They are put into them individually, iced in, and then they are frozen to death in these ice cells, staring out. The implication mm. is staring out to always be guarding the wall, which is what they should have always been doing. The reason I like that is because this, to me, is quite foreshadowy of what seems to happen in the ice cells, or is probably going to happen in the ice cells in Castle Black. This is where Jon Snow is going to go. Um, he mm. announced a fact that he was going to abandon his, his watch. That's what his, the, the last thing that he said he was going to do was, uh, before he got killed was to, to head off down to his home, to Winterfell, um, after getting the pink letter. And so I think this is a little bit of foreshadowing that what will happen to his body after he's killed is that it is put into the ice cells and that is iced over. Now, it's not going to be the end for him. He will come back, I'm sure. Uh, but that, I think, is a little bit of a nod for there. Um, but you talked about the uh, the, the Black Gates, the, 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 the biggest most impressive, uh, scariest, weirdest thing, certainly very old. Um, this yeah. actually comes, it's quite an amusing when they discover this. Sam is coming back down south. He's gone through this, it's a, it's a gate that takes you through the wall. He's come through from north to south, climbs up the inside of a well, which is where it emerges south of the wall, uh, and then kind of like appears right when Bran is telling all of these scary stories. And he's in, I think he's in the middle of like the, the thing that comes in the night. And there's sort of like, and there was this big scary monster that came up out of the dark. And then suddenly he sees this big scary shape appearing up out of the dark. It's Sam, who is the least scary character in the entirety of A Song of Ice and Fire. <laughs> um, but yeah. they have a chat, they go down there. And uh, well, do you want to explain what it is, this gate? Yeah, it's um, one of the most like high fantasy parts of the series, I think. It's a big face. It is a weirwood door with a big face on it. And you have to speak the... Well, it'll ask you who you are. You have to speak part of the, the, the Night's Watch vow to it. And then the mouth of the gate will open up and you can pass through, uh, Yeah, like you said, north to south, south to north. Um, which is, I mean, like I said, it's it's one of the most high fantasy things. It's it's a really creepy, weird image of just this white, wrinkled, wooden face, you know, opening up until it's it's no longer really a face. It's just a hole. Mm. Um, and uh, we, we are told, I think, that it it kind of glows with with eerie light as well. Um, it's uh, yeah. Oh my gosh, it's it's such a spooky sounding, creepy. Um, fantastic door <laughs> it, it, it is and the implication i think is that this may well have been the original door if you have the wall mm -hmm. uh the, the we're told that the oldest bits of the night fort aren't the things on the surface they're actually underground so this may well have been at what was ground level at the time um and you the, the password is you reciting the night's watch vows uh, or mm -hmm. the first half of them there's Again, a subject for another live stream, but there's there's a sort of a hint that maybe the first half of the older vows and then the second half are sort of added on later because uh, there's structurally uh, sort of in a kind of lyrically they're they're different. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, it's the, the mouth sort of opens up and you go through it, and and I think this brand feels what seems like a salt tear dropping down on him. Uh, it's kind of laden with all kinds of symbolism and all the rest of it. 
Um, Sam doesn't seem to have any problem. The, the problem I've always had with this is that if this is the way through, um, Sam doesn't seem to have any problems whatsoever in just reciting a bit of the Night's Watch thing. Uh, mm -hmm. when it's never clear, can anyone do this? Does it know who, you know, if you say it because you've sworn it before, then uh, a weirwood tree, and so the weirwood tree remembers that you've said that before, um, can anyone get through? It's not 100% clear, but... Sure. It's it was kept there even when they had another gate in the night fort uh, mm -hmm. at sort of new ground level. So it seems to have always been this kind of uh, mysterious way through. Do you th think we're going to see that again? I know you've got a thought about how the night fort might appear. We won't get into all of it just now, but do you think we're going to see this door again in A Song of Ice and Fire? I really hope so. I, I think we will. I think we will. I, it's. I'm glad you mentioned the question of whether or not someone who's not a Night's Watchman can can walk up to it and say the words and still pass through, um, because I, I I think Bran, you know, obviously we don't know exactly what's coming in the Winds of Winter. We can kind of extrapolate from the show, but not not fully. Particularly with Bran, is because it's mm. it's such a different story. Um, but I do expect he'll be fleeing south again at some point um, yeah. after leaving Blood Raven's cave, and I would like it very much if this is how he returns. If he if he comes and tries to pass through the Black Gate again, um, there's a there, you know small part of me. I wouldn't say I'm putting all my money on this, but there's a <laughs> small part of me that uh, thinks that this could be the the door that Hodor holds in the books. Um, oh, okay. I say small, you know, small chance because I don't know logistically how that would work because of the 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 Night's Watch vow element of mm. this. Um, maybe there's some cool scene where Bran wargs Hodor and says the Night's Watch vow through Hodor. So you know, some some wild thing like that. I'm sure whatever is coming is is going to be really interesting and unexpected. So I'm not going to try to predict it too hard, but. Um, yeah, it, it feels like it, it should come back. I also think the the salty tear you mentioned, that to me almost suggests that it's Bran watching himself, but like older mm. Bran watching his younger self pass through the door. Um, yeah. Which, you know, it, we, we, we've, we know now that the old gods and the weirwood gods are really, um, a lot of it anyways, the consciousness of the whoever's in the weirwood throne and also the the, the sleepers and the dreamers um in the caves so the idea that maybe interacting with the door is almost like interacting with a person because it's it's this consciousness that's caught up in the weirwood net um and that maybe this 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 consciousness has a personality and is is sad or nostalgic or worried or whatever it is about about bran but um oh man yeah i mean the the mention at the end of that chapter like the the salty tear that drips down and he can taste it um that's i i think for me one of the most memorable and and strange things um in all of brand's chapters absolutely and it's uh, it, it reminds you of the we talked about the weirwood tree which is growing in the night form now that's mm. coming up through the kitchen uh the, the implication has to be that at least the roots must be next to connected to the um, uh, the, the the gate. So perhaps what it is is that that the weirwood tree is sort of sprouted up from that mm -hmm. in some way. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of who to get through, there there's so much speculation you can't go on from this because what we clearly what we see is that a, a person says the password and then they can like usher a whole load of other people through. So uh, right. it's it, certainly Sam does that and he says, "Well, come on." Gilly, bring the baby this way, and all the rest of it. Um, uh, and then he does it the other way around. He sort of like, he says the password, and then he ushers Bran and co. north so that they can go mm -hmm. on their way. Um, so uh, you only need one person, a Night's Watchman, who is there, who can open it up. And it does mm -hmm. make me wonder, is there anyone, if all that takes to get through is a person who was in the Night's Watch, uh, reciting it. Is there anyone up there who was in the Night's Watch engine 
That's sort of hey. someone who was That's... there to start with. Uh, yeah. It would not surprise me if someone like Cold Hands turns out to have been one of uh, mm -hmm. the Raven's Teeth who came up, went north there with, with Blood Raven in the early days. Uh, so perhaps he could do it. He, he said he couldn't pass south. He couldn't pass through because he's dead and because of the magical powers and everything. But right. it does make you wonder what could be taken through if somebody says the appropriate things. Um, mm -hmm. And if you're looking for another weak point for the wall, this has to be it. We're told that there are lots of tunnels underneath it, but this, you, know, you could, anyone could go through as long as the right person, or perhaps anyone, says the password. That's true. Yeah, it, it, it raises the question of um, if there's anyone else who knew about it at any point um, and when the knowledge of it kind of fell out of use, because you could see someone like Mance Raider really, <laughs> really mm. making use of it. Obviously, he didn't know of it well enough to uh, to use it in his attack on the wall. I think he probably would have tried to exploit that weakness. But I, yeah, I mean, I, I, it does open up that question. I'm glad you mentioned Benjen because, yeah, that would be that would make a lot of sense as a way for Benjen to um, maybe re-enter the story in the north um, to to reopen to, to open the Black Gate. Um, mm. if, if you do have to be a, a Night's Watchman, you know, if it has that Night's Watch detector built into the door. <laughs> Yeah, we we simply don't know. Is the thing this is yeah. that this is the problem we have with this door is that it's clearly you you don't create this thing for no reason at all. There's clearly some purpose, and, unless George R. R. Martin was just like, oh, this is a little bit dreary here. Let's create something exciting, and then I like, give no reason for it, which yeah, maybe he did, but but awesome. it's uh, it seems to imply that it has more of a role going forward. Um, mm -hmm. you, you have to say. Um, so we've got this ancient abandoned fort, um, which people seem to have roughly forgotten about. Yes, occasionally people may go there, but in the books, it definitely is starting to uh, come back. So mm. uh, this, uh, it, it's not just ignored there. We've got a much, much smaller night's uh, watch, but when Stannis comes in and he sort of saves the day as, as Stannis does with his with his oh. army, um, uh, and and he basically says to John, he says that I need somewhere for my home base. You need to give me. Hey, let's take the night fort. Uh, the the night fort. So John says, fine, okay, you can have the night fort. Massive. You've got a huge army. It's a little bit run down. It's a bit of a doer up. Or I'll be honest <laughs> with you. Um, uh, but then he sends off. So he sends sends off a whole bunch of people with you know who can do some repairs and stuff i think he did that you know a book or two ago actually it was it was uh so they've been they've been there a while and the idea was while stannis is off doing his thing going retaking winterfell and all the marvelous stannis like things that he's doing um queen Celise was going to be there and she started off at east watch she didn't like east watch doesn't sound like a very yeah. exciting place. I can understand that. So she sort of headed along westwards and she got as far as Castle Black and that's where she's at en route to the Night Fort. So what, we've got this situation where we have um, uh, the Night Fort is being brought back into service. They will presumably find things like uh, the gates, the uh, and uh, they will find uh, the, or they will sort of make it habitable in some way. What, how do you see this um, actually playing a role in the story, um, sort of from the Winds of Winter onwards? So, um, I mean, I'll I'll be full disclosure here. This is something um, Matt, Joe, magician, and I have talked about. Uh, a lot before because we both we, we we are both you know would would easily spend a weekend at the night fort you know um <laughs> but uh so one of the the guy who's sent by john to fix up the place is awful yarwick um first builder and we don't we don't know a lot about him we, we he's on page some of the time but most of the time he's out at the night fort um but he seems to get along pretty chummily with uh bowen marsh and there's that kind of circle of like the old boys of the Night's Watch, like the, you know, the it, it, the boys club at the heart mm. of it. This this 
circle of guys who were not quite peasants, but not quite like super high landed nobility before they came to the wall. Um, who some of them have chips on their shoulders. Uh, some have axes to grind or, or knives to drive into the heart of their Lord commander or whatever. Um, personally, I think that there's a chance that as violence erupts at the wall at the end, after John's stabbing, because it seems like violence is about to erupt. We've got a bunch of armed wildlings. We've got the giant tearing apart Sir Patrick. It's not quite like it was in the show where it's a quiet assassination. It's basically mm -hmm. mid like riot almost. Um, it's, it's yeah, very chaotic and violent. I think there's a chance that Bo and Marsh at all will flee to the night fort. Um, if they're buddy, buddy with Othel Yarwick, um, which I think would then put them in a really interesting position where you have these kind of split, you know, you have the, the night fort branch of the night's watch and you have the castle black branch, which includes the wildlings and, and maybe Celise and her, her coterie. Um, Personally, I would extrapolate on that even further and say maybe there's a chance John, after coming back, you know, in the show we get the the pretty gruesome execution of uh, Ollie and the the other traitors. Um, I think there's a chance we get something like that in the books, but it could happen at the Night Fort. It could be John going to the Night Fort. Um, so that's my, you know, it, it requires a lot of dominoes to line up right. Um, timing wise and you know again relying on the idea that bowen and all them will, will just head over and hang out with awful yarwick um but i rather like the idea of john becoming almost like a like a boogeyman at the night fort for these night's watch traitors um that they are there hold up you know terrified and then john comes back from the dead and you know executes them or or mm. whatever extra judicially extra judicially you know assassinates them or whatever it is um I think that's that's a terrifying idea and uh, would help make John's resurrection less of like a 100% this is a good thing. Because um, I think that's something George likes to do is undercut um, our expectations for when something seems like it should be good. Like with Catelyn Stark coming back to life, that's not, that's not good. That's probably a net negative. Um, and so I think to undercut John, you know, tri triumphantly returning from the dead it would be interesting to have him becoming this kind of, yeah, he's back from the dead, but he's like the slender man or something. Like he's hiding mm. in the shadows at the night fort, like, you know, stabbing people or whatever. I, maybe that, maybe not exactly that, but you know, so that's my, that's my long take on it. <laughs> well, well, okay. I'm going to, I, I love it to start with um, because the night fort has been set up as this place of horrific things, as yeah. this place of, of terror, of things happening in the nights, uh, scary stuff. Um, and one thing, I, I don't know whether you're on the same page uh, as me on this, in terms of John's return, I think I talked about the body. I think that his body will be put, in, put into the ice cells. I think that was very, very strongly foreshadowed in his last chapter um, and a few times beforehand for that matter. Mm -hmm. But um, his mind, his spirit, I think, again, was strongly foreshadowed to go into ghost. So mm -hmm. the issue here is in bringing him back is how you bring him back from ghost into his own body. Mm -hmm. I have long hoped for the idea that we are going to have a ghost chapter mm -hmm. in the winds of winter. Now, I think that would be absolutely fantastic because I think we're going to probably, we're going to see what happens in the aftermath through Melisandre because she now seems to be the, the POV character we've got with John gone, Sam gone and all the rest of it. She seems to be the POV character that we've had introduced there now. If we have Ghost, what is Ghost going to do? Now, Ghost is currently sort of all penned up and all the rest of it, but Ghost is going to go ballistic. John's going to be in Ghost. Uh, mm -hmm. Ghost will with John wants to hunt down the people who killed Jon Snow. Yeah, so yeah. my theory, I just kind of build on what you've just been saying is actually, it's not just John once he's resurrected, sending, taking a team over there. I wonder whether we're going to have ghost being the thing that comes in the night, in the night fort, sneaking around in the darkness, one by one to taking out all of these people who killed him. That for me, that would be uh, astonishing. 
Oh my um, God. I'm getting chills. Yeah. That's, that's, ab that's perfect. Right. Because ghost is, is already so evocative of the, the weirwood imagery and that, mm. that, you know, that old, old magic of the North. And so what better place you're right. Yeah. What better place for, for ghost to come into his own as like a, a, a terrifying force than at, at the night fort, which is kind of the, the source for so many horror stories in the North. Why not? Mm. Why not add a new one into the mix? We're already told that the rat cook became a white rat. Um, yeah, you know. So there's already this imagery of like these white furred monsters in the night fort. Oh wow! Yeah, I love that. Yeah, oh, seventy nine sentinels were there again. That's a John idea. That they're yeah. there on the watcher. It's uh, it's it, it works perfectly for me. This this idea. Um, yeah. Added to which we've got so John. Your I completely agree as well. He, whenever he comes back, however he comes back, he is not going to be just this great, perfect character we've had before. George R. Martin has said it, uh, is that, is that he said Beric Dondarrion is is basically, he is the foreshadowing, is that mm. when you come back, you lose something of yourself. Yeah. And with Beric, each time he came back, he lost something. He forgot the, you know, the face of the woman he loved, or he forgot the taste of food or whatever it was bits of him were lost uh, his soul was lost each time with john uh, something of um of who he is is going to be lost and as we also saw through varamir when you uh, become part of your animal if after you die you then go into your animal skin change into them you become more and more like them so yeah. the john that we get coming back after all of this is going to be changed different and more wolfish so um that's the i think that's the um uh, the kind of the imagery that we're going to get and so if john then comes back after killing all of these people uh and he's then pulled back into his own body his own body having been frozen and it's like chiseled out or something like that um then uh then he is going to be a different character and that's the point at which i see him heading down to winterfell but we're slightly getting ahead of ourselves there i suspect a little bit um the question then is uh if you were because i'm going to run with this because i love this idea if you were one of um uh, the gang the 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 night's watch bone marsh and all the rest of it yeah. in the night fort would you be tempted to head north of the wall? Um, uh, would you see that as your way way out? Yeah, I mean, I can. Uh, yeah, that's a good. That's a good thought. Um, yeah, you'd be looking for any way out, and if it looks like the the the, the tide has turned against you, you know, if if you're going to the night fort because everybody wants to kill you. Uh, everybody wants you executed, dead, whatever it is. Um, yeah, the South is not looking like an attractive place to be. You're either a deserter or you murdered your Lord Commander. And either way, you know, you're, you're, the penalty is death. And at that point, yeah, the only, the only, uh, the only chance is is going north and just kind of taking your chances with running into some wildlings or something. Um, are you thinking? Are you thinking that they may discover the Black Gate? Is that I mean, I mean, it's not very well hidden. This is one of the yeah. things about the Black Gate is that, yeah. um, yes, if you're not, if you're just like there, just like as Bran was, then yes, you wouldn't think to go down. Yeah, you wouldn't think to go down a well to find it. But yeah. if you're repairing the the, the night fort, mm -hmm. what are your mm -hmm. priorities there? Well, you need to make sure you've got a water supply. You need to get the kitchens up and running. There are going to be people there heading down into the well, figuring it out, repairing the kitchens. They might, hey, they might even chop down that that nasty white tree that's been growing up through it. Um, so I think there's a very good chance that they will discover the Black Gate. Mm. Uh, the question is what they do with it. Uh, if you find this magical black, scary gate, what do yeah. you do? I mean, I. I I mean, you could kind of wall it up because it looks a bit scary, but I don't know. Do you just leave it there? It's it's a really the odd. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a really really odd. I mean, do we put a doorbell on? I mean, I don't I don't know. What's that? Was what's what's the idea yeah. here? 
Um, oh, yeah, okay. Good question. So uh, I think that, that sort of looking slightly further forward out of all of this, um, once we've got that initial bit out of the way, is the night fort just, is it just a thing on the wall? Do you think that there's any chance that this is going to have a longer term role in this story beyond you know, the few chapters in, in the Winds of Winter? That's a that's a hard one because it feels you know it being the site of the Night's King um, hmm. and it being the first castle on the you know the kind of the OG castle, um, it feels very significant and it feels like it should be something that plays a larger role in the end of the story. Um, as I think about specifically how that can happen, it seems like you know. The end of the others. I, I really like the idea uh, that that happens at Winterfell um, for so many reasons. Um, if not Winterfell, then the Night Fort. I feel like <laughs> like the Night Fort is like the the backup version. Now, I mean, I, I think it would be interesting if the wall falls, as we mm. can be pretty sure it will, um, and the Night Fort in some form survives. Um, it was still as a ruin, obviously, but I think it would be. If there's a if there's still a night's watch at the end of the series, um, I think there's a certain amount of of poetry to the night's watch returning to the night fort at the end of it all, um, and that becoming once again like the only real castle, the only real seat for the night's watch. Um, yeah, but I, I don't know if the night's watch will survive the series, so that's <laughs> that's a hard, you know, as an no. order would they area anymore um, yeah what, what, I, what the whole what the point of them is actually i mean i right. there's a there's as much of an argument i think to be said that at the end of all of this they will tear down the whole wall um mm -hmm. uh, because it's now served its purpose uh, yeah. as to say well they will repopulate it with night's watch and somebody appropriate juror or whoever will become the new law commander that for, for me i think there's a, there's an equal argument either way there but yeah it, it was historically the Night's Watch um, sort of main base, and so it would make sense if going forward it takes on that role again. Um, I found it quite interesting when you were saying that if it's not Winterfell where the kind of the final confrontation with the others is, then the Night Fort. Um, my, my, my take is if not Winterfell, then the Isle of Faces and that whole mm. area around there. That's where I kind of see it. I think that if the wall fell, but they didn't get the others didn't get any further than the castles built into the south face of the wall, then I think I would be a bit disappointed by their invasion. I have to say, um, yeah, that I, I think they have to at least get as far south as Winterfell for it to be uh, feeling like they are impacting on the things which matter to us. Because yeah. as a as a reader, we've not we've bought in a little bit to Castle Black. If we saw Castle Black fall down, we go, oh, that's a shame. We're happy memories there and all the rest of it. But really it's Winterfell is the place, the first place where we actually go, oh, ouch, why, you know, this is, we, we saw those children growing up there. This is, this was their home. Um, so I think uh, Winterfell is built as the backup. If the wall falls, yes. then it's Winterfell's role to be protecting the realms of, of men. I think that's true. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I see the night fort in this scenario is almost more like, um, like, <laughs> like Bowser's castle or something like <laughs> if, 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 so I, I mean, I, I believe that, and I, I don't want to run too far off on, on a different track here, but I, I do believe that the end of the others will involve some metaphysical stuff with Bran, right? Like that they'll, that he'll, he'll have more of an active role in, in, uh, ending the threat of the others than maybe he did in the show. Um, but that, that may happen in the, in the, the dreamscape or in the, you know, the metaphysical world. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So in that sense, I could see the night fort as almost being like, uh, like uh, the setting in this kind of metaphysical space where it's, it's the seat of scary stories. And so it's where Bran has to descend to, you know, to, to, do battle with the heart of winter, whatever, you know, like whatever mm. that is. Um, but I agree completely. Like if the other, <laughs> if the others get to the night fort 
and then just kind of coast. And they're like, yeah, no, we don't need to go further south. You get the picture. That mm. would be very disappointing. That would be a it, shame. It, it would. It would. Um, so I think they have to. They have to do yeah. something. I mean, absolutely. Uh, and I mean, on the show, they showed them destroying the last half, effectively. So we saw one thing that they destroyed. Um, I think that we will get a little bit more uh, of that in mm-hmm. the books. Mm-hmm. Now, my my overall, slightly straying into the others' territory here, but my overall take is that the magic that created them or, or is the sort of keeps them going or something has to be undone. And I think that that is, uh, that is the key to how th- this whole thing's going to end. Um, and they were sort of trying to show that, I think, on the show, the yeah. idea, um, uh, you know, you you judge as much as you wish whether they did it well or not, but I think the idea that they were trying to put across was that the others were created by putting dragon glass into the heart of this particular person in front of a weirwood tree, and it was undone by putting Valyrian steel into the heart of this particular person in front of a weirwood tree. Uh, mm-hmm. That seemed to, and, and the idea was that it wasn't just killing the Night King, it was undoing the spell that created them in the first place. And I think that that is the, the takeaway message we have to have from the show, not this is the way it's going to end. It's not going to end that way. Um, they were very clear that they decided this was Arya oh, doing this and all the rest of it, which is a very clear clue that this didn't come from George R. R. Martin. Um, but the fact that it they had to be undone, not just killed. So right. um, right. that for me is what makes me think of the Isle of Faces as being what we would consider the central, the hub of the Weirwood Network or where, where their main base is or something along those lines. So, uh, yeah. so that's my overall take there. Uh, but we're straying a little bit away from the Nightfall. Um, is, <laughs> there, is there anything else you want us to sort of add in um, just to sort of, Add to our knowledge or any other theories you've got about what what might have been going on or will be going on in the night. Well, I, I do want to give a, a little bit of a, another shout out to, to Stannis. Um, I think before season six of the show, there were a lot of theories that Stannis would end up as the sort of Night's King at the Night Fort. Um, after season six of the show, after after Stannis died, uh, or season five rather, season five. Um, uh, those theories dwindled quite a lot, I think, because people took that as a sign that Stannis's importance was was going to to go away as well. But I I do still I don't know I I love the imagery around Stannis and Selyse and Melisandre and the Night Fort. I think there's just this really interesting like stew of kings and these these magical women. Um, mm-hmm. You have the, the the Knight's Queen, obviously, and then Melisandre is the complete inverse of that. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I very much like the imagery around Stannis, around Melisandre, around the Night Fort. Um, it doesn't seem like the story is going in a direction where Stannis will rule from the Night Fort as the Dark King of Winter. Maybe. Maybe I guess, um, <laughs> but I mean, who's to say? I, I don't think so. But you know, the- yeah, yeah. Uh, my, yeah. Again, if I'm putting money down, it would be on no, no. That's not going to happen. Um, but yeah, no. I, I think that's really rich imagery, and and one of my what, when I think of the Night Fort, I think of Stannis, and I mean, maybe the fandom is is some to credit for that because of all the theories and things that flew around. But it's just such strong, strong imagery there. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't personally buy into that, I have to say. I completely understand, and I think that George R. R. Martin was trying to do uh, the the symbolism that you were sh- saying about the opposites in terms of the, the knight, Knight's King and the Knight's Queen. The knight, Knight's Queen, by the way, is not a phrase anywhere in The Song of Ice and Fire. That's one that the fandom has made yeah. up. Um, yeah. uh, and But to have Melisandre and uh, Stannis there as a sort of an opposite of it... I think that was definitely deliberate. Um, whether that means that they're going to be set up there, I I doubt it myself, but so, hey, who knows? I think one other thing I would say, though, is, is I, I loved when we were talking about this um, comparison to Harren Hall, because yes. they're both this kind of like, they were huge, they were massive. We're, we're told all the time about all these things that are, uh, um, you know, 
how big the stables are and, and how many hearths there are and all the rest of it. Um, and both of them are now in states of disrepair. There, it, there's a few people who are there, but not enough. That uh, certainly that was the case with mm-hmm. Nightfall for quite a long time. Um, and when we saw the uh, Harren Hall in all its glory, was actually when there was this horror stalking and killing lots of people there, uh, Jacken effectively. Uh, and mm-hmm. and this was uh, somebody who could blend into the background and not be seen, but would be killing people. Um, this does kind of fit in with this idea, as we have with the night fort, of maybe somebody, maybe ghost, is going to be going in there and killing people, um, uh, and and this kind of like assassiny kind of feel. Um, yeah. It does also make me kind of wonder if. Um, when we talk about the Knights King and the Knights Queen, the and the chain of logic that gets there is quite a long one, so I shall just cut short to the chase uh, and say that I think that there's, there's potential for the, the greater comparison to be across to um, Euron and potentially Cersei mm. um, in the south. He's got a lot of these kind of Knights King vibes, and certainly we see in the pre-release chapters from the Winds of Winter, there's this idea of him having a sort of a effectively a corpse bride this is um cersei seems to be the logical person who this might be might they set themselves up in harren hall as mm. a sort of a an opposite of uh, of what was going on there anyway. yeah yeah i mean I, I certainly yeah they yeah the cersei euron connection um that was definitely a lot of people's first thought when the forsaken um was read the 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 bride with hands of pale fire i think is the mm. descriptor um and there's also been a lot of theories flying around for a long time that euron will will meet his untimely end uh near the isle of faces or over the god's eye um as, as a you know echo to the original battle over the god's eye with aemon one eye um and it's interesting too you know heron hall and the night fort are both right on the threshold of something far more magical right the, the night yeah. fort is sitting there right on the edge of the wall and the wild north and the weirwoods and all that and the, the and heron hall is sitting right on the god's eye and the isle of faces is just across the water and they're both in this kind of um this position of you almost see them as like Yes, they're gigantic castles, but they are playthings compared to the like magical thing that exists near them. Um, and I think, yeah, it, it's it's a very evocative image to have the the guy who makes compromises with with magical forces and sets himself up as a material power in this giant castle being undone by um, these yet more powerful metaphysical things. Um, so I love that idea of Euron and Cersei. I hadn't thought of them taking up at Heron Hall. That's a that's a that's a great thought, um, especially given that, uh, yeah, all, all of the imagery around, you know, Euron one eye and the God's mm. eye is yeah, it's it's that's very strong. At the Night Fort works here really as a template, I think, for us to understand other horror stories in Aswaf and and to, um, yeah, to to project forward then and look at. The places where George is, is, you know, making a rhyme scheme, and we can see the way the the next line is going to rhyme. Um, yeah. yeah, the next word is very useful for that. It is, and and it's it's being the focus of a lot of these stories. Though we, there there are a few others that we haven't mentioned, um, but they have kind of references. There's there's, there's um, Danny, sweet Danny, someone or other I can't remember the name, who was this um, uh, this girl who dressed up as a boy. You get kind of Arya vibes going on from that. There's 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 um, uh, there's a lot of these uh, stories that we get that are uh, linked in with it, that is allowing us to see what's going on in the much wider world. And and the other thing I would say about a Harren Hall, just to sort of probably to the comparisons, is that there is definite feeling of some sort of heresy against the Weirwood Network at Harren Hall. Uh, because they chopped down weirwoods to, in order to make them part of what was going on there, and this was about creating a castle that was um, the greatest that humanity could do, um, and uh, that it is you know it's unstoppable. 
Um, obviously, it wasn't, and it got burned down by dragon fire. What was going to happen to the wall? Well, maybe it's going to also get burned down by dragon fire. I don't know. Who knows? Anyway, is there anything else? Uh, but we'll wrap this up soon. But is there anything else you want to just sort of like add on as a, a final thought about the night fort? Um, you know, I would give it uh, like a two out of five on Airbnb. I think um, <laughs> it's uh, the accommodations weren't great. Uh, loved the tree, little chilly. Probably wouldn't stay there again. You know, unless the hosts change. Um, yeah. No. I, I. Yeah. I mean, I'm. I'm enamored with the night fort. It's. It's. It's so interesting, and like I said, such a good template. I think. It is. So so I think, I mean, to sort of summarize my view on this is that I think that the Night Fort is used um, as this base for these stories, often horror stories, which we will see the importance of elsewhere in Westeros in this story. The, the, the hints there, the people being fro frozen, uh, 79 Sentinels, um, with the thing that comes in the night um, <coughs> with... Um, uh, all of these, uh, the, the rat cook, hugely important, giving us lessons about what's important and what's not across the piece. That is what George R. R. Martin did. And he literally had them doing campfire stories when Bran was there. They were just sitting around telling ghost stories. And that was what he was wanting, was to open up the wider world of, of A Song of Ice and Fire. So this isn't just a sort of a place. He wanted this to be an expression uh, of sort of like old man, what old man's role as much as anything else was just to give us this idea that this was a much bigger world than just these small things that we've seen there. There's there's things out there that we don't fully understand. Um, and that is what a well-rounded universe should be like. So the Night Fort may well appear in the Winds of Winter, um, uh, but its primary role, I think, is just to be this, this hub of where these stories and this horror are based, which can be permeated throughout the rest of the story. Uh, I, uh, Michael, thank you so much for coming on. This has been a fantastic chat. Do you want to remind people where they can find you in the internet? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, yes, so you can find me on Twitter at Bookshelf Stud, which is my, also my username on, on Reddit, although I'm not on there as much as I used to be. Um, yeah, Maester Monthly is the main podcast you can find me on. I also have a... a, a fiction podcast that I've been doing um, where I write and produce um, a bi-weekly fiction serial called the chaotic neutral chronicles. So you can also find links to that at uh, on my, on my Twitter. Basically I'm on Twitter all day, so you can find me there uh, anytime. <laughs> yeah, and, and, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's an absolute pleasure. Well, I, I, one thing I love doing with these kind of chats is introducing uh, people who watch my videos to the wider world of the Song of Ice and Fire a community and people like yourself have been doing this for many years and uh, I would highly uh, recommend you go and check out uh, some of those places. Mesa Monthly is legendary within the community. <laughs> So um, uh, please dig. I'll put a link down in the description um, uh, if you'd like to go and check that out. Um, okay, guys, we'll uh, we'll have another one of these next week with uh, with someone else to talk about and another uh, fascinating place, uh, a mystery in the world of ice and fire to be uncovering. Um, I will make you disappear for just one moment so that I can point at things. Uh, if you're interested in these and you want to watch the other ones that I've been talking about, Old Valyria. Winterfell um, or the Faceless Men, then there's going to be a link appearing around about here in a few moments. Uh, if you'd like to support this channel, get access to some of the stuff I do just for my patrons. Uh, there's a whole load of extra benefits on there if you're interested in that. Uh, check it out. There will be a link appearing around about here. Uh, okay, guys, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Uh, take care, and I'll see you all next time.